I really wanted to deal with the root uh, of this issue, and that's why I chose to look at lust, uh, which uh, I'm glad that Dr. Vogler mentioned that lust is a state uh, and not a specific act. We, we tend to conflate the two and think that lust is an act, but when we talk about the deadly sin of lust, it's a state of the, of the soul, of will. Um, w one of the things, you know, my father said by 20, everybody's an expert on at least three of the seven deadly sins. And by 50, you've, you've got all seven pretty much under your belt. But I did ask him about lust. He's 84 now, and I asked him last year about lust. Uh, when, when do you finally overcome that one? And he said about a half hour after the cadavers cooled. <laughs> so uh, and, and I think anybody that's ever worked in a nursing home or knows about what goes on in nursing homes will testify to that truth. Um, you know, dealing with this problem, I, I, let me tell you how I got uh, involved in this first. I, I went to Catholic schools, and uh, I, I was in a boarding school for high school, and I think the, you know, maybe 14, 13 or 14, somebody s in, in inevitably s smuggled in a Playboy or something, and this is, this is the way I think people of my generation were introduced into pornography, but what's interesting is the memory of that first experience is very strong. And I, th and I think people can testify to that, that it, it's very strong, which indicates how powerful uh, sexual images uh, affect a person. They imprint on a person. Now, one of the things uh, young people do tend to react initially, especially with hardcore pornography, they will act uh, in disgust. That their reaction is one of disgust. Um, you know, the, the 60s or 50s Playboy, I think today would be considered like uh, great art uh, compared to what's on uh, the internet. And I, I think a lot of people don't realize just how uh, vile this stuff is. But I, I want to quote uh, Pope here. Uh, one of the things about poets is we tend to forget that they are social scientists of the past. Um, they often have extraordinary uh, insights into the human condition through observation. But Pope said, vice is a monster of so frightful mean as to be hated needs but to be seen. Yet seen too oft, familiar with her face, we first endure, then pity, then embrace. And I think this is uh, in light of neuroplasticity. I think it's, it's very interesting that the normalization of these things takes a long time. Uh, people's reaction to pornography when it was initially introduced into society was not an instantaneous acceptance. There was an immense amount of revulsion, especially when you're dealing with a culture that was still rooted in a Christian ethos. Now, as the Christian ethos has eroded and Christianity in many ways has become more like the world as opposed to, to making the, mo the world, molding it in the image of, of the celestial world, you know, the city of God. The city of man has, in a sense, co-opted Christianity in many ways. So there are a lot of Christians that will actually argue that there's not really much wrong with pornography. I mean, you will find this out there. You will even find ministers today that might recommend going to a sex counselor and uh, using this to enhance one's uh, life. But one of the things that I wanted to, to look at was the, the, the object of, uh, of desire. Um, before I do that, I, the, the reason, when I became a, a, a devout practitioner at about 18 and really led a, mon a monastic life for um, several years, uh, when I came back to the United States after being abroad, uh, I married uh, fairly quickly um, and really didn't think about pornography as an issue other than that I was seeing it out there on the, on the periphery. But uh, somebody two years ago came to me with the Google indices of pornographic downloads in the Muslim world and the sex, sex searches, which were some of the highest in the world. And that, that really shocked me to, to find that out. And uh, that got me interested in the topic. And so I read Pamela Paul's Pornified, which I, if you have not read it, I really recommend that book because that opened my eyes to the extent of this problem. But uh, I, I decided to open up this issue in the community and invited Pamela Paul last year to speak in Toronto. She spoke to an audience of 15,000 Muslims. Uh, and, and then I spoke after her and 
both of us were very surprised at the reaction. First of all, th there was an immense amount of relief that this, the subject was being brought up. Many women uh, in, in hijab wearing the traditional covering came afterwards and told me that they were so happy because their husband had a problem with this issue. So this is an issue that is if, uh, affecting all of the different religious communities. We know that pornography is a problem in the Christian community. It's certainly a problem in the Muslim community. Now this creates an immense amount of cognitive dissonance. So I think you can imagine, especially for Muslims, when in, in many ways Islam is far more pre-modern uh, in its, in its uh, practice today than Christianity, which has been through an Enlightenment, Industrial Revolution, and a lot of uh, different perspectives and uh, reformations. But in the Muslim world, uh, lowering the gaze is a Quranic injunction. Uh, it, it says in the Quran, tell the believing women, men and women to lower their gaze. That is more pure for their hearts and to guard their chastity. And then it says, and tell the believing women not to display their ornaments uh, except what is naturally shown from them. So the idea is asking women, and I think that was brought up yesterday, to uh, help men in, in this visual problem that men have, that they are deeply stimulated by the, the, the female image. But if we look at desire, I mean, desire is a very interesting English word. It comes from uh, a Latin uh, phrase. Which, which actually meant to await what the heavens would bring. So desire is rooted in something celestial in, in the classical understanding of that word. Um, what's interesting in Arabic, the word for desire, baghi, is also uh, a, a, a cognate of the word for oppression and the word for prostitution. So uh, the, the, it, it, it's interesting that uh, when, when we get to these root words, we tend to get to how ancient peoples viewed these things. Now, uh, Socrates mentions uh, in Philebus, which is an often ignored dialogue about uh, the relationship to pleasure uh, and, and other virtues, but one of the things that he uh, points out in there, which I thought was very fascinating, is he talks about desire uh, and he uses the analogy of having thirst, thirsting for something to drink, and he asks uh, Protarchus, is it a desire for the drink? And he says, yes, uh, obvious Socratic foil. And uh, Socrates says, is it for the drink or for the replenishment with drink? In other words, is the drink a means to, to an end, which is the replenishment, the sense of emptiness that comes from being thirsty? And Protarchus agrees. And, and Socrates says, therefore, when somebody becomes empty, he apparently desires the opposite of what he is experiencing, in other words, to fill himself. So desire is essentially an attempt to fill a void. And this is why when we look at pornography, we have to look at it in light of an emptiness. What is the emptiness in people that this is an attempt to fill that void in their life? And I think one of, one of the most important people uh, for looking at that is, is Kierkegaard. Uh, I, th I think it's really beneficial to look at what Kierkegaard, because Kierkegaard uh, really saw a lot of what was coming. He recognized that something very serious was happening. Uh, in Europe, and he saw a lot w of what was coming. But I think his identification of three modes of existence is very important in relation to this. The aesthetic mode, which is basically a hedonistic mode in, in which people live for pleasure and desire. And one of the things that he says is this is rooted in boredom. And that's why, to me, one of the fascinating things about people that become addicted to pornography is they get bored quickly with uh, soft core, they move to harder core. Some of these people, according to Pamela Paul's uh, book, some of these people end up in pedophilia who had no interest in pedophilia when they entered into pornography. So we can see the mechanism of lust. Now, if, if we look at lust as a problem, I don't think anybody in the history of the English language has summed up this thing better than Shakespeare in the 129th sonnet when he said, the expense of spirit and a waste of shame is lust in action till action lust. And I think this is the hot state that was mentioned yesterday where people will, will literally change their moral views about things in this state. And that's why I don't think that it's hyperbole to say is perjured, murderous, bloody, full of blame. Savage, extreme, rude, cruel, not to trust. Enjoyed no sooner but despised straight. Past reason hunted and no sooner had past reason hated as a swallowed bait. 
on purpose laid to make the taker mad. He doesn't tell us who lays the trap. Mad in pursuit and in possession so had having an inquest to have extreme, a bliss in proof and proved a very woe before a joy proposed behind a dream, and there he means nightmare. All this the world well knows, yet none knows well to shun the heaven that leads men to this hell. And I think if, if people that are in pornographic addiction or seeking help, th they would be the best commentators on what he's talking about because this really creates a hellish state of the soul. And I don't think we, we, we've looked enough at the pain of these people that are dealing uh, with these issues. It's very important. Now, I would argue that moral philosophy has as much to say about this as religious philosophy. And I know that some of the religious people have asked, where is the religious perspective? But I think as religious people in this room, we have to deal with the fact that in many ways religion has failed. Because this problem is so widespread because of the failure of religion. Now it's been said the devil has all the best tunes. Um, and, and I think there's, a, in fact, William Booth, uh, the founder of the Salvation Army, I think made that observation. And so his strategy was to use the tunes of the devil in hymnals. Uh, that's a little difficult with pornography. Um, the devil has the best images, so what do we do? Well, uh, part of that is recognizing that there are, are other types of awakenings. The sexual awakening is only one type of awakening in the human being. And, and the pleasure awakening, I mean, uh, Kierkegaard says that there's no reason for nine months of gestation and then several years of, of, uh, of nurturing a, a, a human being if they're basically going to have the existence of a slug that seeks pleasure and avoids pain. That, that, that this, it, it would be better to produce human beings like larvae that are just hatched out of filth. Um, that if, if, if so much energy goes into the production and the nurturing of a human being, there must be something more here to a human being than simply the hedonistic pursuit of pleasure. And this is where he argues that it is the ethical life that is so important. Now the ethical life is a life in which Kierkegaard said has to be at least one commitment to another human being. You cannot live an ethical life without commitment. One of the most important and, and, and really terrifying aspects of pornography is that it is an utter disregard for human beings. There is no thought, and, and Dr. Scruton mentioned this the other day, about using images where the, these are objectified uh, images. There's no person behind the image, and yet that person is often an abused uh, uh, woman whose moral agency is, is questionable given her life history. Uh, some of these women are in sexual slavery. Uh, we know that in, in sexual slavery there have been uh, pornographic uh, materials found in these busts of people that are sex trafficking. And this again is the optimization of profit. It's a lot cheaper to use a sexual slave in the production of a pornographic film. So we have to look at immoral capitalism. And, and, and I think a lot of us tend to forget that Adam Smith was a moral philosopher as well as being the father of capitalism. So this, this type of, of pursuit of wealth without any morality is a major problem in this issue. But in the politics, Aristotle says, if he have not virtue, man is the most unholy and the most savage of all animals and the most full of lust and gluttony. It's interesting that he puts lust and gluttony together because in the Catholic hierarchy, gula is, is, is the substrate of luxuria. You need gula. And I think our obesity problem should be looked into because when you have an abundance of animal spirits, you know, so people have too many calories. And this is why in, there's a recent uh, study that's going on about uh, calorie, caloric deprivation. People are eating 15,000 calories a day in a scientific study to, to see the longevity effects. They've committed to this, but in, in Time Magazine where I read about this, one of the things that they mentioned was a decreased libido in these people. So the relationship between gluttony and lust is a real relationship, and one of the ways that both the church and Catholicism used in addressing this problem was fasting, literally to deprive oneself of caloric intake. Now, uh, in the Catholic tradition, and, and, and uh, I think this is very fascinating to me. The deadly sins are sins that kill the life of the soul, 
leaving the sinner without sanctifying grace. They are not individual actions. These are states of being. So when somebody is inflicted with the deadly sin of lust, they are in a state of lust. When they look at women, they cannot help looking lustfully. Christopher Hitchens is a wonderful example of this when he said in an article in Vanity Fair that it was hard for him to look at the mouth of American women, young American women, without thinking of fellatio. So, I mean, and this is, uh, you know, you can read that on the internet if you're interested in the article, but this is a state of lust. When this, this is how you are looking at the opposite sex as a me, an end, a, a, a means and not an end, a means to your own pleasure and gratification. Now, uh, what's fascinating to me about the Catholic uh, form, uh, understanding of this is that what is rooted in sinfulness is love. Love is the root of sinfulness, but it is either love perverted, love deficient, or love excessive. The perversion of love is in the cold sins, the seven deadly sins, that anger is necessary for social justice. Lawyers have to get angry if they're going to do anything about it. And Hadley Arcus, I think, can testify to that, and, and other people that become indignant about things. But when that love for justice becomes perverted into a love for vengeance and, and revenge, th this is where it becomes sinful. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And this is the sinfulness of anger, of ira. You have also the perversion of, uh, to get to the hot sins that are obviously the most interesting to us, um, you, you have the perversion of the three animal kingdoms. Excessive love, I'm, wow, five minutes. Okay, man, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get to the end. You can read my paper. Uh, so, but uh, let, let me, uh, let me just finish, you know, uh, Chastity, <laughs> which unfortunately has been conflated with prudery in modern culture. And there is a difference between chastity and prudery. The, uh, the St. Thomas Aquinas says that chastity is the regulation of the sexual urge. And as Joseph Pieper shows, uh, Aquinas was not a prude. Aquinas actually believed that part of the purpose of sexual intimacy was pleasure. He did not see it simply as procreation, which is often a misunderstanding in the Catholic tradition that the Catholics recognize the, that, that sex is also for pleasure, uh, similar to the Judaic and the Islamic view of sexuality, that pleasure is part of the reason why God has given so much pleasure in that intimacy, but that pleasure in a true loving relationship, unlike a lustful relationship, is far more about giving the other pleasure than taking one's pleasure. And anybody that has been in a truly loving and intimate relationship with the opposite sex knows the truth of that statement that is far more about giving pleasure than taking pleasure. Um, I just, one of the things I really wanted to, 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 to point out was, um, and, and I'll just, uh, is, is about cu concupiscence of the eyes. Uh, Joseph Pieper says, not for nothing does the Holy Scripture name concupiscence of the eyes among the three powers which constitute the world that lieth in the power of evil. It reaches the extremes of its destructive and eradicating power when it builds itself a world according to its own image and likeness, when it surrounds itself with the restlessness of a perpetual moving picture of meaningless shows. What better description of pornographic images? and with literally deafening noise of impressions and sensations breathlessly rushing past the windows of the senses. Behind the flimsy pomp of its facade dwells absolute nothingness. And this is what Kierkegaard talks about despair being at the root of the hedonistic lifestyle. And, and, and this pursuit of pleasure is merely an attempt at masking the emptiness that they fill, the void of emptiness is being filled with titillation, stimulation, and purience. So, uh, in, you know, I, there's two things. I want to close just um, with something before I get into uh, dealing with this problem. You know, uh, William Blake says the nakedness of a woman is the work of God. Chastity and purity have always been the great virtues that come naturally to women, but which men must learn. The Quran uses Mary, the mother of Christ, as the great paragon of chastity and virtue and purity of heart and describes her as an ideal for men and women an ideal for men and women. 
quote, and God has made a, an exemplar for those who believe in Mary, who guarded her chastity. So we breathed our spirit into her, and she confirmed the pronouncements and scriptures of her Lord and was among the pious. It is from women then that men learn chastity and purity, which in turn protect the sacred nature of women, alluded to in the Arabic word for woman, hurma, which means that which is sacred. Now the failure of men in imitating women in their natural virtue has resulted in women rejecting the double standard of men and imitating men in their natural vice. The spiritual power of women is great, but so too is the power of their physical attraction to men. It is this power that causes vile men to dominate women and virtuous men to honor and want to protect them. But that physical power of the female form over men is a sensory power that veils men from her metaphysical meaning. Her sensual form prevents man lost in carnality from knowing her spiritual reality. She is the source of mercy in the world. The Arabic and Hebrew word for womb is rahim, rahim. From that is derived the word for mercy, rahma. An expression, and the womb is also an expression of the creative power of God in man. In degrading women, we degrade the highest qualities of our human nature. In elevating her, we elevate our highest nature. When her natural virtues, compassion, kindness, caring, selflessness, and love predominate in men. Men are able to overcome their natural vices and realize their full humanity. When, however, those virtues are absent, men descend to the lowest of the low and are worse than beasts. In unveiling the outward beauty of a woman, we become veiled from her inward beauty. As a poet from the distant past, Jamir, who is the equal of Rumi in Persian tradition, said, I said to my rosy-cheeked lovely, Oh, you with bud-like mouth, why keep hiding your face like flirting girls? She laughed and said, unlike the beauties of your world, in the veil I'm seen, but without it I'm hidden. I want to just offer quickly, and I'm done, uh, just some ways of dealing with this. The first is tipping point principles. We have to influence mavens, influencers, connectors. We have to get to these people. These people are going to change the discourse. We have to understand the power of context, the common wheel, the importance of, of children in the public space, that they should be guarded from these type of degrading images. Uh, in, the, in the 60s and 70s, feminists argued that pornography was exploitation of women. So what was the pornographic reaction? Well, OK, we'll make it equal opportunity at exploitation. So now we have to bear naked images of men on Calvin Klein uh, advertising and things like that. Uh, the second is, I think, to, to recognize Callie Lawson's approach in Adbusters, the uncooling of brands, and, and make an uncooling of pornography. Uh, in movies now, you often see cool references to pornography. It's a hip thing. I'm a porn star in, in, in practice, this type of thing, that we have to make it uncool. Losers do this. This needs to be done in Hollywood films, things like this. So it's, it's seen for what it is, that it's a pathetic and degrading state of a human being. Also, business studies, because if you really want to get some funding for serious studies, then just show businesses what they're losing in productivity because of people using online porn. Last week, uh, Time Magazine mentioned that uh, since the recession, pornography in, in the workspace has gone up considerably. One of the things they're, they're only measuring is paid pornography. They're not measuring free downloads. So I think there's some important studies. If we can show the business community the harm in productivity, we're going to get some funding to really look at this thing at a deeper level. Religious secular alliances based on the protection of children and family is very important. Toynbee warned us the vulgarization of culture. When the elite become vulgarized, it's a sign you're on your way out. And he studied 21 civilizations to, to come to that conclusion. When, when Paris Hilton becomes a porn star, something's very seriously wrong in our culture when, 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 when these people are, 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 uh, are completely vulgarized. Um, finally, uh, censorship, taboo topic. But hey, Karl Popper, in his last interviews, which are worth reading, and this is the man who wrote The Open Society, was arguing that we have to enforce censorship laws when it comes to violence on television. He said, we're going to destroy our culture. And I think if he knew uh, the devastating impact of this and the social science behind it, I think he would be saying that about that. It's something to think about. Um, finally, I, I really want to thank you. We are not the first pornified culture. 
People tend to forget Pompeii was a pornified culture. When Pompeii was excavated, one of the things they found in the houses were murals, pornographic murals, uh, cunnilingus being performed. These were taken and hidden and used in a private museum for the aristocrats. So aristocrats used to visit this. Now they're open for the public because it wasn't deemed uh, acceptable to show the plebeians uh, these type of images. But I think in many ways Pompeii is a beautiful metaphor. If we allow the pornification of this culture, we may find ourselves buried in the ashes of, 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 of the meaning of our society. Thank you.